Welcome to January's PDX Byte. I'm Derek Wong. I work on the EXD4 and XFS file systems at a certain company that everybody is snorting about in the back. <laughs> Anything I say tonight uh, probably has absolutely nothing to do with my employer. You know, I haven't looked at my email all day, so as far as I know, I still work there. <laughs> So this talk is uh, entitled Fun with File Systems 2015. I intended it to be a sort of a wrap up of what we've been working on in the second half of 2014 in terms of storage on Linux and some hint of what might be what we might be end up working on in the first half of 2015. So in rough order, I would sort of I'll start by talking about fuzzing, which is uh, its own interesting work generator. Some improvements that I've made to the XT4 FISC utility and the resize utility, and a couple of new features for EXT4. And after that, I will go into a bit more about what's going on with XFS and uh, the storage stack in terms of automatically deduplicating <coughs> de devices and shingle drives. Just before I get started, can everybody in the back hear me? Yeah. Cool. Also, as a disclaimer, I make about one presentation a year with slides, so when I completely screw up and crash the computer, don't mind that. All right, fuzzing. So, some of you may know what fuzzing is. As a, it's a very interesting debugging technique where you take, you take a. Pr a properly formatted data file and then you flip bits in it in, in interesting places, whatever that means, and then you feed it back through whatever program you're working on in a mad attempt to make it crash because this way you can tell your boss that you're working on things. <laughs> also, if you work in one of those places, I don't, where they pay you by the patch, then this is a good way to write yourself a new Mercedes. <laughs> There are some interesting techniques to be aware of when you're actually fuzzing. One of them is that it's a really good idea to try to bias, your, bias the bits you flip towards the higher end bits. This is so that if you have a file format that say contains pointers to other parts of the file, you've now changed them into really big 64-bit numbers just to see if the program will actually naively try to follow all the way to the end of the file. Also, there's also another way to do. Or there's also another side effect. If your program happens to be run on some big Indian machine, that's also a really good way to fill the, to fill buffers with obviously suspect values, which will then become obviously bad values on both platforms. Or I'm sorry, on both on platforms that support both types of Indianness. I mean. To be honest, there are more, there's more than big and little Indian, but I don't think Linux runs on any of those platforms, so I don't really care at this point. And as the fourth bullet point points out, it's also a good way to shake down new features. Actually, it, it, I used this particular technique in the middle of the year to shake down the, both uh, the new inline data feature of ext4 and also metadata checksumming in both file systems. <coughs> Now, to expand a little bit on fuzzing, what I did, basically what I did was I, I set up a tight loop script which would MKFS a file system, copy some random data onto it, and then I, I wrote a XFS fuzz, an E2Fuzz program that would read the file system, assuming it's correct, of course. It would then figure out which blocks in the file system were specifically allocated towards metadata, and then it would try to pound on those blocks specifically. At the moment, neither XFS nor ext4 actually have data block checksumming, so there's not really any point in corrupting data because the file system has no ability to detect that yet. And honestly, then you're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack. Hey, I corrupted this one thing way out here. Can you find it? Versus Hey, I corrupted the block bitmap. Let's see if you will uh, actually try to chew your way through it and destroy everything in the file system, or will you actually at least detect that, hey, this is broken and jump out? 
also was a good way to figure out how many, where are all the really bad bugs in E2 Fisk? You know, it's, it's kind of surprising to me how this thing has been around for 20 years and yet it was still pretty easy to find bugs in it that would crash it. You know, directory handling, things, things that you wouldn't really expect would be experimental. We understand why, right? Sure. Historically, it was one of those things you don't touch because you might break something. And so, you know, even when you found a bug, no one would let you think, would take your patches to fix it. it was, it's 20 years of that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fortunately, there's a, these days, there's a test case or a regression test framework in E2FS prog. So it's a lot easier to go to Ted and say, hey, guess what? If you run this, it will crash Fisk. Here's a patch to fix it, and then you multiply this by two or three hundred, and he eventually just gives up and starts committing your patches. <laughs> All right, so some improvements in Fisk itself. I, a long time ago, Valerie Aurora wrote some patches to speed up Fisk by speculatively prefetching in metadata blocks to Fisk before it would analyze them. This was shot down on the grounds that, well, you have this crappy IDE disk here, it only processes one command at a time. What does it matter? Read ahead isn't going to get you much, except on people who have expensive systems. Well, that was seven years ago, and we now have expensive systems in the form of SSDs. So I thought, it's time to pull that back out of the closet and try to stick it into Fisk. It does have the nice property that for not a whole lot of code effort, I could reduce the Fisk run times from 20 to 40 percent, depending on what kind of hardware you have. There's one nasty regression where if you actually do run on a really old IDE disk, it will actually run slower, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we're at the point where even SATA drives actually see benefits from this. You know, the, the, fact that, the mere fact that you can actually at least throw multiple commands at the controller and it will process them semi-simultaneously, even if the disk is too dumb to know what to do with it is somewhat of a win. Also, as an implementation note, I was lazy. The, the, the original idea was that you could, or Ted's original idea was that why don't we just go and make our own page cache? And I said, no, 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 that's way too complicated. So there's this wonderful call in the kernel called, was it, POSIXF advise. And you can, you feed it a file handle and arrange a start and an end and some kind of flag. And the flag tells the kernel what you intend to do with this range. So originally it was so that you could actually read it, read ahead data blocks, or you could tell the kernel, hey, I'm gonna be accessing this thing randomly, so don't waste your time doing read ahead because it's not gonna matter. But it's also sprouted some extra features like, hey, I'm done with this, throw it out of the page cache. It works a little bit too well. You, you can actually write the horrible, horrible app that goes and tries to guess which pages are in the page cache. Let me evict them so that you can, so that the page cache hit ratio can decrease. More, import more importantly, it's, we use it for this, the uh, directory analysis passive FISC where once we're done analyzing a directory block, we tell the page cache it can go away because we don't need it and we'll never look at it again. <clears throat> And fortunately for us, the kernel handles all the threading issues and, and page cache and coherency problems. So all I have to do is figure out which blocks do I want, call this thing, and it returns more or less immediately. And provided you did it far enough ahead of your read command, suddenly your IOs don't cost you anything anymore. And they don't cost you anything. But as you can see, it actually does have some useful effects. See, Resize2FS. I discovered that Resize2FS is this awesome little program. Offhand, it would look like it's the sort of thing that simply lets you resize a file system, make it bigger, make it smaller. But it actually does quite a bit more than that. It, it has the ability to remap inodes and blocks all over the file system, which in effect means that if you want it to, you can use it to completely reformat the file system, leaving all the data blocks intact. A fun test that I haven't quite gotten around to is to go boot an old copy of Debian from about 1996, format an ext2 file system, and see just how far forward in time I can bring it without losing anything. But 
then Christmas break got in the way. But it's, it's really cool because it will load all the file system metadata into RAM. And then once you've done that, you can rewrite anything you want on the disk. All you have to do is remember to keep up with the bookkeeping to push things aside, which means that if you have some cool new feature that you want to add to the file system, like, say, converting it to 64-bit mode, you can do this, and you don't have to do the dump everything out to a huge tarball, reformat the whole file system, copy everything back. I mean, the recommendation is you still do that just to take advantage of better block allocation in ext4, but some of us have better things to do than well, to watch tar run. <laughs> oh, but you can back up to the cloud, Bart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But so that's res that in a nutshell is resized to FS. I also got a really weird query. There's a new feature we're adding to MKFS that lets you point it at a directory, and MKFS will create an HD4 image with the files in that directory. And <clears throat> resized to FS has this minify mode where you, it will go and shrink the file system to the minimum size possible. And we used to think that that was kind of a useless feature. Why would you ever want to create minimized images? And it turns out that actually it's useful for containers and things like that. And even better, this is actually an improvement over the canonical advice, which is format, mount, copy, unmount, shrink, because due to a, due to a bug called the XT4 block allocator, it will spread your files all over the disk trying to ensure that the files themselves don't get fragmented. But this has the occasional horrible failure case where you format a root file system, say, and it will put user at the beginning, it will put var at the end, and then you r try to run disk upgrade, and you seek back and forth writing package records and writing files. Not so good. Well, MKFS is dumb. It puts everything at the beginning of the disk, like that brilliant thing called fat. <laughs> oh no, FAT is a wonderful file system. It, it works everywhere. It's fairly easy to understand what happened when it explodes. <laughs> if, you, uh, if, if you're a particular fan of old DOS tools, it was really int quite interesting as a kid to go and pop open Norton Disk Edit and try to go bang around with the FAT editor to go find out how does this thing really work? And what happens when I do that? <laughs> All right, but moving along. <clears throat> uh, so now, now, I'm, now here are some features that we're putting into E2FS progs 1.43. So ext 4 and XFS are both kind of getting tired of getting, of getting harassment from people who say, well, ButterFS has these checksums, so you can detect any kind of storage error. Well, that's partially true. It would be nice if we had some ability to detect when file system metadata blocks get corrupted in transit because you had a bad disk wire, because your hard drive firmware has been reformatted with badware, or something like that. And one of the one low-hanging fruit is to add checksums to all the metadata objects. This, of course, doesn't help you with actual file contents. There is sort of a, there is still sort of an argument to be made for why pay the cost of checksumming an entire file if you really don't care. If you really care, you can always go and store your own hash, but mm, I don't know. It's, de it's kind of debatable. I like the idea that the file system should be able to tell you, hey, I think this is kind of broken, but here's your data anyway. You can try to fix it or you can just scrape it off and try again. But in the meantime, we could at least protect the metadata. So XFS actually did a, bit, did a more complete job than ext4. This is by virtue of the fact that they defined a totally new disk format, and so they have finally had space to implement back references from metadata blocks to wherever it came from. With ext4, I was trying to be a little bit less, hey, let's change everything -y when I designed this. So basically, it, the ext4 version is you put in a checksum that's calculated based on the file system UUID and say the, I, the inode number and the block offsets and other, other things. So at least you can tell 
well, is this, is this the block I'm expecting to get or is this some other piece of crap? And when you get a piece of crap, it will shut down the file system and it will tell you to go run Fisk. Versus the, what would happen in the old days where if you, if you say corrupted a block bitmap, you might get a couple of warnings about, hey, I noticed though there seemed to be a lot, a big discrepancy between the number of blocks in this bitmap and what's listed in the group description, but I'm going to use it anyway, so I'm going to allocate blocks and then, well, bad things happened after that. Oh, I mean, it's, it's a good way to keep your day from becoming boring. <laughs> However, where I, one thing I will add is that I've been working on metadata checksums for X4 for a long time, for, since about mid-2011, so I think it's finally ready. The XFS version has existed for a year, and Dave Chainer swears it's stable. I'm not quite sure what he's talking about because I discovered that you can trivially emulate an XFS file system by corrupting the inode B tree, which then makes the journal unreplayable, which means it won't mount and it won't re repair, and so you're just kind of stuck. So, so it's good, because it means I have something to do this year. Also, the last point, memory errors. Metadata checksumming, or checksumming in general, it can be a good way to detect certain problems. Unfortunately, it's not good at detecting all, pro all the problems depending on how the checksumming was implemented. If you're particularly paranoid, you would detect a write and then you would immediately checksum it and then it'll sit around in the page cache until it gets evicted, at which point you would check it again. And then you could at least tell, hey, do I have, did bits flip in memory without me noticing? No one does this. We just sort of, the kernel just sort of assumes that your memory is trustworthy just like it assumes that your CPU is trustworthy. I mean, I, I suppose that's a valid design point. But uh, every, every couple of months, I, get, I see a blog post or an email from somebody who said, hey, I, ran, I copied these files to my file system, and then I ran MD5SUM, and I got six different answers for six different invocations of MD5SUM, and this is why ButterFS is better. Well, no, it's reading that out of the page cache, so actually your memory is bad, and ButterFS can't help you. At some point, it would be interesting to implement the paranoid check version of ext4 checksumming, where it would compute the checksum at the time you modify the object and then again when it commits it to the journal, but I haven't gotten around to that. Yeah, See, it already has all the copy and checksum stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, work in the life in kernel land is you have this big pile of stuff and they all sound really cool, except then this whole money and getting paid thing gets in the way and you have to go work on actual customer bug reports. And some of them are interesting, but some of them are kind of boring. The Pharaonic Sky isn't here, is he? Yay. All right, so inline data. Basically, there's unused space at the end of the inode record. By default, we reserve 256 bytes for it, and the inode structure only uses 156, so there's 100 bytes left over for stuff. On ext4, the 100 bytes can get used for extended attributes they, they can also spill over into a separate data block. And I forget, what, I forget which Google competitor it was thought this up, but they thought, you know, we have a lot of really small directories in our cloud storage system. So it would be really useful if, you could, if we could put that directory data into the bytes, byte space after the inode. And so they did. This does... This has some interesting effects. I actually tried running, making a minified ext4 image and discovered that I could actually use less space by importing a directory tree into a fresh ext4 image with inline data turned on. But unfortunately, it's not quite stable yet. There's still some race conditions that we need to work on. But it, it does have some promise. I mean, it, in terms of the number of seeks, when you're searching through the directory tree, it does actually cut down the amount of time it takes to look through a directory by quite a bit because there's a lot of little directories in the root file system like user share foo. 
And the only entries are like changelog.gz and readme, and those will fit in here just fine, and why waste its blocks and seeks on reading that kind of stuff? Assuming you don't just trollishly just RM it. Finally, E2 undo. So turns out that there's this rarely used feature in E2FS progs called E2 undo. And as, the, as you might guess from the name, it enables you to save a copy of old data blocks when you're doing something to the file system. So that if the program aborts or if you decide you just really don't like what it did, you can always undo it and it will set everything back the way it was. Unfortunately, it turns out that E2Undo wasn't all that well implemented. It, uh, it borrowed the trivial database code from Samba, which has a two gigabyte limit, which previously that wasn't a problem until I came along. And it would do some kind of crazy things like it would, it would optimize writes by saying, I'm only going to save a copy of block X once. The first time you write it, I'll save it to the undo file, but after that, I don't want to be writing this thing over and over again. So it would do this by searching through the TDB tree to go see if it could find the key. But doing that requires several disk accesses, and then storing a, storing a block in transactional mode apparently requires four F syncs. <laughs> So, so woohoo, we didn't write it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, and the other thing is that it didn't really have any particular checks for overflows. If you, hit, if you went past two gigabytes, it would just kind of rip off the top 32 bits of the file position and just start writing again. So in the end, you ended up with this corrupted undo file that didn't do anything. Now, normal, for the things that you could do with E2 undo in past versions, it was, you, the damage was limited because it would, it would only, you could only undo an MKFS anyway. So it's not so bad. But I thought, well, let's add it to all the other tools. So it's now attached to FISC and Tune2FS and Resize2FS and FISC. Part of this is because if you want full strength metadata checksumming, you kind of want to turn on the extents feature and you kind of want to turn on the 64-bit feature because, well, due to, due to certain problems with the 32-bit file system format, you only get full strength checksums on all the metadata blocks if you enable 64-bit mode. And the FFS style indirect block maps have no space to add checksums. So, so there's this kind of, there's a conversion step, which is convert to 64-bit, convert everything to extent mode, and then add metadata checksumming on top of that. But this basically means that you end up, you have to rewrite every single metadata block on the file system at a bare minimum just to add the checksum. And suddenly, suddenly I actually found a use case for spitting out four gigabytes of undo data and discovered that, hey, this undo thing doesn't work. Also, also, the overhead of querying the disk every time you want to find out, do I have this block, do I have this block, do I have this block, was quite a bit. Um, I ran a benchmark on a, two, on a quarter full two terabyte file system and with the old undo, it would take about, well, I pressed control C after three and a half hours. And with the new undo format that I designed, which I'll talk about in a minute, it, I cut the overhead down to two minutes. Which still sucks because it only actually takes three minutes to convert the file system without the undo file. But I suppose two minutes is better than three and a half hours. So, so it, it, I thought about what's an undo file? It's, it's basically a block journal. Here's a block and where, here's where it goes. Here's another block, here's another block, here's another block. We don't really need to have a, a B tree index of all the blocks. It's use. It's useful to keep that in memory when you're writing the undo file so that you don't double write things. But really, we just want to land the disk blocks on disk as fast as we can and then write some kind of table that tells us where those blocks came from. Now, obviously, in a couple of minor optimizations on that, you write extents instead of blocks because why not? So that's basically what I did. I implemented, re-implemented E2 undo as a, as a new journal format. So you know, I thought about reusing the JBD2 journal that already comes with the XT4, but there are certain problems with that in that, in that uh, 
while you can have external journals with ext4, it expects the UUIDs of, of the journal and the file system to match. And so you have, effectively, you can only associate a file system with one journal at a time. And rather than go and modify a whole bunch of code to make that work and possibly break the scariness that is JBD2, I thought it would be wiser to just write, write a simple thing. Also, it turns out that JBD2 explodes if you try to make it larger than 16 terabytes. So I'm confused about how you use this in practice. So do I run E2 undo and it starts effectively a journal, and then I run my FSCK or whatever? Oh, it's, it's specified as an argument to E2 FISC okay. and tune to FS. But how is it implemented internally? Is there a system called that sort of turns on journaling? Is that how it works? I'm not quite sure. Oh, no. There, there's a, there's a uh, block IO abstraction in the E2FS library. OK. So, okay, so this is all in user land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's unmounted. It's just oh. doing block IO. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So let's see. Moving along to XFS. So XFS has this new version 5 disk format that I touched on earlier. It adds, as far as I can tell, it adds metadata checksums and a free inode B tree. I think this should improve the scalability of the file system because before it would search through the inode B tree to find free inodes when you tried to implement a file or tried to allocate a file. But uh, I, I had a kind of a hard time finding documentation about what exactly went into this version 5 format. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> Fifteen years later. <laughs> so, I th it it looks like it's supposed to work. I mean, I crashed it within five minutes, so it works I'm not convinced. Than EXT with its combinatorial explosion of options. I mean, you can stare at EXT and set the wrong. I mean, you said it yourself. Don't do the 64-bit with the thing and the thing. Mm -hmm. So, it's a lot simpler than that. And in that case, it, it's comparable and closer to stable than not. They still have some nasty, like, as you said, log replay bugs, but they've got the mm -hmm. big scary ones out. It's not default, though. That tells you a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not default yet. Yeah, I, I did read a paper a while ago from Dave about how the, exit, how the new XFS log is supposed to work. I thought it was quite clever. I then hoped that the implementation was just as clever. Scary. I don't know. I, 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 Every couple of weeks at work, I have this little debate with myself. Is it better to have something kind of dumb like ext4 where the, the, the basic layout is pretty simple, such that when it explodes, you can actually paste the whole thing back together again, sort of? But then you lose certain things like it has horrible scaling problems. Every time we want to design a new thing that basically looks like a, here's a key and a value. Store this, and I'll I'll grab it later. We go and implement a whole new data structure for some weird reason. Versus the file systems that do do that, but then you have to walk this tree, and there's and it's hard to tell is this does this tree thing actually make sense? And I guess in the end, you kind of you do you have to weigh that against the ginormous flood of how do I unscrew up my ext2 file system how tos on the internet. I don't really know what the, what the answer is to that. I like ext4 for its simplicity, both in terms of the disk layout and also the code, because there's really not that much of it. Honestly, I look at ButterFS and think, well, the, features, the promised feature set is really nice, but there's more than twice as much code as ext4, and I can't really understand any of it. And I kind of wonder, how do you store 100,000 lines of code worth of institutional knowledge in your brain, and I haven't figured out how. Actually, finally, last slide. DMD dupe. There's an, some researchers at the University of Florida proposed for inclusion in the kernel a thing called DMD dupe, which is a automatic deduplicating block device. Basically, it, it stores blocks and it maintains in, an index both of a logical block address for the traditional access and also an index by hash so that if you try to write something, it will calculate the hash, see if it can find another copy of it in the tree, and if so, then it will discard it, which is either clever or insane, depending on how you look at it. I have some problems with this thing. 
as the last bullet point points out, it doesn't really handle hash collisions. I would expect that you would go and reread the block on the disk and compare it with the thing you're trying to write to make sure that they actually match, but it doesn't do that. And curiously in the paper, the authors say, well, the chances of a collision with CRC32 are this really tiny number. CRC32? <laughs> okay. I could be wrong about that. I, I don't remember the exact hash they were using. They might have been using something equally problematic like yeah. MD5. Yeah. But in any case, they said, well, the probability of a hash collision is less than the probability of a disk error, so we don't care. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And crypto security mm -hmm. has to be both, right? Because yeah. even if it's even if it's a billion bits, if mm -hmm. if it's a CRC, then yes, I'm going to cause your file system problems just for fun. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean it that actually do that. Yeah, to, in, in their credit, you can actually configure which hash algorithm you want to use. Yeah. So you don't have to use CRC thirty two. You can actually plug it into SHA two fifty six or something. Yeah, with SHA two fifty six I buy this argument for the same reasons I buy it with Git. I mean, Mm -hmm. just, it's it's, it's probably different. good enough. Though I actually I then tried benchmarking it, and CRC32 has this nice has the advantage that you can write things fairly close to disk speed. Yes. SHA-256, not so much. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't know. I mean, I clocked it writing at about 20 megabytes a second, which is pretty good. No. Yeah. Um. Well, are there any optimizations in the correct code for spans of blocks? I mean, or is it pretty much you do a checksum per block? It's a checksum per block, but yeah. but it well, it's technically a checksum per cluster, where a cluster is any number of blocks. Okay. So, do they? What is their use case? Are they like one of the places I've seen it used is backups, and so I'm backing up the same database like you know, mm -hmm. seven days in a row, and it your savings. This one is incredible. Because Mm -hmm. Are they really going for that high throughput, or are they really going for the GPU communication? It's hard to say because the abs the introduction to the paper says would answer yes to that. It's pretty clear that if you want it to work properly, you probably only want to be using it for backup purposes or some something where if it's where performance isn't that big of a deal. I mean, I don't know, going from 200 megs a second to 20 is still kind of a big deal, but, but I mean, it, it's early yet, theoretically, you could optimize this a bit more. I don't, I don't, I'm not entirely convinced it was actually using all the cores of the CPU. So nobody reviewed it, and so I stepped out and started reviewing it, and I sent a whole bunch of questions and heckles to the authors, but I haven't heard back from them, so we'll see what, where that goes. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> it's 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 too bad because the kernel community has a bit of a scaling problem. It's the same scaling problem we've always had, which is that there's not enough reviewers for the amount of code that gets dumped on there. So big things like this would get pushed out on the mailing lists and they say, please, please review and please, I don't know, help us find some kind of path towards inclusion or something before our grant money runs out and we have to go work on something else. But no one gets around to it, so then what? It would be, it would be really nice if there was some way to just you know, clone, clone all of ourselves and just have a reviewer version of us, which could, go in, which could spend their days simply reviewing code. But, but you would. I mean, all the rewards in the community are for writing, you know, for doing things, not for reviewing things. And so if you clone yourself, you just have two of you. Doing things instead of doing things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem would be twice as bad. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I've I have written reviews of my own code because no one else will review it and no one will take it until it's been reviewed by somebody. <laughs> so I send out mail I send out mailing list traffic and then I let it sit for a couple of months and then I start reviewing it and send follow up patches and eventually someone says, well, it's been reviewed, so clearly it must be good. All right. The system works. Mm -hmm. It was reviewed by somebody. Maybe we trust the somebody. I don't know. 
Shingle drives. No, nothing yet. <laughs> we talked about shingle drives at, the, at last year's Linux Storage and File System Summit. And so far, not much has happened. What is that? So, uh, good question. Shingle drives are a trick to increase capacity or increase aerial density of magnetic disks by overlaying tracks on top of each other like shingles on a roof, instead of laying them out next to each other. This is, it's, it's apparently useful for about a 25% increase in aerial density, but it has the distinct disadvantage that since the write head is bigger than the read head, you have to rewrite all the tracks in order. Otherwise, you end up with scrambled junk on the disk because the write head will come along and just kind of screw up everything in the adjacent tracks. Yes. Both. Yeah. Depends on if you want to pay for the firmware to do the what amounts to garbage collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if, we, there are a few tricks. It kind of sounds like some of the disk drive vendors, at least the one who is yelling really loudly at LSF, is going along with the strategy with the uh, strategy of you will rewrite in 256 meg chunks in order, or you will suffer an enormous performance penalty. You know, I guess we could just set the sector size to 256 meg. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are other options. I mean, we could invent our own translation layer type thing to smooth, it, smooth the path towards acceptance of shingle drives. I mean, heck, you might even be, it might not even be too horrible just to take the performance hit. Yeah, the it, only ones you can buy now are 5400 RPM anyway. Yeah, to I mean, just deep store drives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these drives are really designed are these for. New eight terabyte drives. Or? Yeah. Oh, those were those were this. Well, they're. God, what was it? They're four platters, but six gig, six terabyte or something. It's one Seagate model that I was able to find on Amazon. Yeah, Seagate has an eight terabyte one out now too. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it might be if they're if they're fifty four hundred RPM and they have like a vault or archive branding, mm -hmm. that's these. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Apparently, you back. You theoretically could buy a shingle drive too. They've apparently been ship quietly shipping them in some of the external hard drive enclosures. In DVRs. On the grounds that, well, USB 2 will only give you 20 megs a second, and a shingle drive can do random writes at 20 megs a second. <laughs> so you're never going to notice. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's hard to tell which ones are which. Yeah. You know, I actually want one of these just to play around, but I don't want to go buy like a whole pallet full of these worth of these things just to pick out the ones that are actually shingle drives. Well, no, you can buy the shingle drives raw at Amazon. Um, yeah. They, uh, they uh, are brand new, though. I mean, they've just been the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see <clears throat> Yeah. It's tempting. You know, apparently they're only 270 Yeah, I'm going to probably buy one. I'll make Oracle pay for one. <laughs> I'll see how long it takes them to give me one. <laughs> All right, exit. click to exit presentation. So, does anyone have any questions? What was that kernel call you mentioned? Um, I think POSIX. it's POSIX F advise. Yeah, okay. I think. It's it might also be POSIX read ahead. It's POSIX F advise. Okay. All right, well. Well, so you promised to end with some predictions about. Oh, yeah, predictions. Tell us about 2015. Predictions. Um, well, I guess ButterFS will be stabler. I mean, as, as weirdly buggy as it can be, I imagine that mass deploying it around Facebook will tend to shake out a lot of the bugs. Or it will take Facebook down, in which case we'll all get a whole bunch of free time back. <laughs> um, I don't really expect ext 4 to make a whole lot of advancements at this point. We're kind of in this, the community's in this funny space of, we have the stable file system and maybe we should add a few more features to it, versus ButterFS where they seem to be the opposite. We have all these features, but we need to stabilize this pretty badly. 
Um, I've heard rumors that they might, that uh, full data block checksumming is coming somewhat soon for EXT4 and maybe along with it reflink and some kind of snapshotting type th ability. Yeah, think about it, it's not, shouldn't be too hard to add some back references that tell you, well, this came from, this block is in use by this many files and it points back to these places, oh, and here's a checksum. Uh, let's see. I sadly suspect that there probably won't be a whole lot of, of advancement with regards to shingle drives because it will probably still take a while for all the relevant parties to get them and start playing with them and then find the time to actually do something. I mean, at the last at the last file system summit, summit Ted So and Dave Chinner had a loud discussion about whether or not we should simply abstract the whole process of allocating and rem allocating blocks and remembering which blocks are allocated into a separate device mapper layer. It has some merits, but uh, again, who's going to implement this? I actually thought, well, if you actually wanted to try to do something like Frankensteining ext4 to abstract out the block allocators and make the XFS block allocator work with ext4, how would you? And it kind of turned into a mess. It's hard. And there are more than just those two file systems. I mean, we want to keep in mind that you know, while those are the main fielded ones right now. Yeah, yeah, that, that, stuff. yeah, that was just two. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, maybe we could try out. Try just adding them to something else. Hey, Fat, how would you like to have delayed allocation? <laughs> <laughs> Bart. I'll keep asking questions. Sure. Somebody interrupts me. Um, SSD, uh, mm -hmm. what's the state of sort of SSD specific stuff in the file systems right now, and how is that expected to change in the near future? Oh, good question. So, uh, a lot of people have noticed that. IOPS scale, the kernel doesn't really scale well with IOPS, as in we have these fabulous SSDs that can give you a million IOPS, but the kernel will end up stuck in lock contention hell if you actually try to use them. <laughs> I actually tried doing this just as a joke to see just how many IOPS I could push through an SSD and I hard locked the system. Yeah. Yay! There, so, uh, there's a there's a new uh, path through the block layer called block MQ, which separates all these things out. So instead of having one one queue that all the CPUs get to lock on, it will have all kinds of cool features like per CPU queues and that feed into it into the device. I think that this is probably something that will work really well once you once it's lit up and connected to something like NVMe where the hardware itself also has a whole bunch of queues but uh, for now it's sort it's working its way through upstream it's in the kernel as of 3.18 you can enable it by default I discovered that there are suspend bugs if you do so don't <laughs> but uh, the preliminary results are pretty promising but like all new things, that you, you still got to give us time to shake the bugs out. So I, th I think that will become stable-ish by the end of the year. Yeah, and that may be as far as people go. Yeah. In the initial SSD firmware generation, everybody was tripping over themselves to get allocations and I/O alignment and all this stuff down on the flash cells. And firmware's caught up enough, caught up enough now that it's just not worth it. Well, I know there were erase ahead issues. There's all sorts. There were, but the firmware now is not like. Well, but it can't though. I mean, the, the, so the point is, that last I checked, and maybe I'm just way out of date, the kernel wasn't doing a very good job of telling the disk when blocks were free so it could erase them. Yeah, the, where trim is still pretty crap. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that does need some work in the file system, you're right. But there, like in ButterFS, it has an SSD option and it does almost nothing. Okay. But in, in E2, is that better and will it get fixed this year? It seems like it needs to get fixed bad. It seems like a... Which, which one? Discard and trim? Yeah. Trim. Um, yeah. Martin Peterson has made it, uh, has apparently made it its life's mission to fix discard and trim on Linux. <laughs> he, uh, well, it, as a bit of background, the eight, there's this, on flash drives, you want to be able to tell the flash controller, hey, I don't care about this range of blocks anymore, so don't go to extraordinary measures to try to remember it in the flash translation layer. 
This is called discard or trim, depending on whether you're talking well, at or that, SCSI. It's the erase speeds are way, way slower than write speeds, so once you've discarded or trimmed it, the flash drive can start, the drive can start erasing those. Yeah, yeah. Now, so yeah, but the biggest problem is that in ATA land, the trim command is advisory, meaning that the device is free to ignore you. And there's supposed to be flags that tell you that, oh, once you've called trim, this range, I will only give you zeros if you try to reread the range, but that only happens if it actually did something, which it's free to not do and then not tell you. And so Martin is trying to fix that, at least get the code to the point where if the kernel has been told that it zeroes data and is telling you, that the user space program, that it zeroes data, then yes, actually the trim does work and works immediately. So maybe that will get fixed by the end of the year. I mean, it's, I guess from what you said earlier, it's only important to fix it after you can push enough IOPS to the controller that you'll never notice the mm -hmm. release ahead times. Right now, it sounds like you can't anyway. So well, no, it's more. It, there's also a correctness issue with that because some programs like MKFS would like to be able to know if I tell you to discard and you tell me that discards result in zero reads later, then I don't have to do all this file system initialization. I'll just issue one big discard and then start, and then just write magic numbers. And you know, I can skip initializing the inode table because I know it will be all zeros. And the problem is, is that if the kernel fl flags are crap, then you can't do any of that because you might get old file system contents and then all kinds of haywire screwy things happen when Fisk comes along. But isn't that sort of second order yeah. Yeah. compared to the, I just dropped a 2 gigabyte file on the ground, um, you know, will you please go start, if you can, please go start dealing with this now so that later when I write those blocks again, it will mm -hmm. happen faster. I mean, yeah. Right, and that, that's where the kernel uh, file system implementations are behind. They're right. built to either put on every free, right. and then you break drives, or it's not queued, so it's really slow, or it's an ioctal, and it's all of the free space when you can remember to write the cron job or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because the devices have been so unreliable, people haven't sat down and spent the energy to really batch it and do it efficiently, right? But I guess what I'm not getting, and I shouldn't belabor this, we should probably take it offline, but I guess what I'm not getting is, I mean, for that application, you don't really care what the firmware does as long as it does, as long as, you know, it, it, some does, of them, part, it does total ordered consistency, right? Some I of them sort of, you know, I tell yeah. it, trim this stuff, it does or doesn't, nothing I can do about it, right? But when I come back later and write, I'll get the same result either way. Yeah, the zeroing optional mm -hmm. stuff is different in second order, but the yeah. reason people haven't dedicated the kernel in time into implementing it in the kernel yet is that it breaks drives. <laughs> it's, yeah. well, what, is, what do you mean? Oh, breaks they, drives? They don't come back. <laughs> oh, it breaks It right. has historically, and that's why the current implementation is oh. kind of like, what the hell, it's an ioctal and you can do it if you're brave. Wow. Mm -hmm. they well, were you mean bricks is in like you, you can't drive get it off back. and on again or some drives, yeah. yeah. Drive they are gone. Bricks is in, they're gone forever. You, yeah. never get you can't even flash new firmware on them. There have been a few. And that, that That's meant nuts. Yeah, that I mean, meant there was just... no way it was gonna be the default and there was no way that people were gonna spend time on it. They just and that's, it's roughly back. historical bank. Yeah, so. I just can't believe manufacturers are getting away with that shit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If you can if you can imagine a defect in a USB enclosure, it's there. Worst crap you can imagine. <laughs> Why well, do the USB enclosure? I meant the drive itself, right? There's yeah, yeah. I mean, there's same thing. Yeah, wow. there's wow, incredible stuff in there. Yeah. Wow. Speaking of yeah. brave, if you uh, have Ubuntu 14, it has a cron job that goes and runs FS trim on any on all the file systems. I find it interesting that it does this, considering that it doesn't do any kind of verification that the file system is intact. <laughs> I mean, I, what could go wrong? Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought it was, it was it was an interesting attempt at doing the sort of right thing. I fixed it to at least go and run fisk n and see if, there, if it reports any errors, and if so, then don't do the FS trim. But uh, by default, it just goes and does it and hopes for the best. And I guess I hope the best for them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in conclusion, if I have time, it would be interesting to try implementing something like online E2 FISC, but I don't know if I'm really going to get around to that. It's a, it's a large task, and that's probably why no one has succeeded at it yet.
Also, there's this problem of what do you do with open files that are corrupt? You know, is it acceptable to just go and kill Dash 9 all of them? Or is there some way to just close the file descriptor magically? This is what we've been talking about for 15 years. Well, yeah, but we've been talking about that for 15 years. Well, don't you just, don't you just do the same thing you'd always do if a file got corrupted? You get an EIO next time you try to interact with it? That's what Revoke does, but yeah. it's hard to implement because there are serialization problems. People are using descriptors when you decide to pull it out from under them. And nobody's, I mean, BSD said this is called forever, right? And, Linux has never managed it. And you want it for unmounting forcefully, you want it for a bunch of stuff. Hot unplug just hasn't happened. But I mean, mm -hmm. the whole people are using it shouldn't matter too much, right? Like I said, the next time they try to use it, they're going to. No, I mean, like C pointer to reference are using it. Oh, okay. consistency problem. I see. The kernel just needs a bunch of kernel work to it's get it all entangled. Really fiddly stuff. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did actually ask Al if it. Alvero, if, that, if Revoke would work for that. And he thought about it for a really long time and then said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing I would add to this before you close up, mm -hmm. is there are probably people in this room who might be interested in working with this stuff. I mean, you know, a lot of what you've talked about today is how a lot of this is bound on the fact that a few people are doing a lot of things mm -hmm. at once. Yeah, if you're, if you're interested, contact me. I'm DJ Wong in the PDX Byte IRC channel. It exists. I forget which server it's on. <laughs> I think there's like three people logged in right now. But uh, if there aren't any other questions, I guess I'll close.